Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. In this tutorial, we're going to be tweaking the motion of our particles and our particle simulation here that we were working on in the last tutorial, just to make it look um, rather more interesting. So um, let's let's go to particle.cpp here. Uh, so if, if we look at this at the moment, one of the problems with this is um, the explosion looks too uniform, especially in the early stages. Um, all the, the particles have a, a speed that's sort of uniformly distributed um, or somewhat too uni uniformly between the middle of the circle and the outer edge. And that means that it has a rather sort of blocky circular appearance, especially when it starts out. Now, one, one thing we can do to change that is um, in the particle constructor here, we're, we're assigning a speed to the particles and we're giving that speed a uniform random distribution between no, uh, naught and some figure that we've decided on here. What we can actually do is simply to square the speed. So I could say m underscore speed equals m underscore speed times m underscore speed. Or, more succinctly, the same thing can be written as uh, m underscore speed times equals m underscore speed. Uh, now, if, if we look at that now, it's going to probably be much too fast. In fact, we don't... I think we've got a tiny glowing spot in the centre, which is um, probably the remnants of the particles that haven't shot off the edge. Let's try changing this to uh, a much bigger figure, this constant that we use in deciding the speed. See how that looks. So I think it's still much too fast and what we're seeing now is just the remnants of the particle in the middle there. Let's add a naught. So we need to experiment a bit to find a good value now for speed. And I think that looks quite a lot better. So if you look at this explosion now, you'll notice it's a lot more ragged. And the reason for that is that by squaring the speed, we've meant that the average distance between the particles increases as you go from the inner edge to the outer edge. Well, this is putting it in uh, language that's a little bit loose mathematically, but uh, we get a, basically a different distribution, um, which exaggerates more the distance between the particles as you move towards the edge, which I think looks quite a lot nicer. Now another thing we can do is um, give the particles a bit of curl. So um, let's, let's go to the update method here. And before we calculate the x and y components of the speed using, uh, yeah, of the speed using the speed and direction, we can, we can um, add something to the direction to make the particles curl around a bit. Let's say m underscore direction and we'll use the uh, plus equals, we'll use the interval in here to um, ensure that this happens uh, in a similar rate on all different systems. So interval times, and we need to put in some sort of constant here, which I don't really know what it should be. Um, let's, let's try some figure like this, which might be good or might not be. Let's try running this and see what happens. So now the particles are curling rapidly and indeed um, this thing is imploding a bit. Let's try something a lot smaller. I'll put another zero in there after the decimal point. And still very rapid. Let's try another zero. See how that looks. We want something a little bit subtle. So they still seem to be spiring very, very rapidly. Oh, yeah, because I've written 4 instead of 0 0.00, apologies. Let's try something more sensible like this. Okay, let's try this. So yes, now we've got a subtle um, curl there, relatively subtle. The, part, um, the explosion is still sort of um, imploding in on itself, um, and we, we need to do something about that. One thing we could do is just try a slightly smaller value still, but we're going to have to fix something else here, I think. 
Yeah, so now the curl is so subtle that you don't even really see it. So I, I quite like this sort of a value, I think. But we want to change something here um, to make this a bit more interesting. So there's, um, there's a couple more things that we could change here. Actually, there's sort of an infinite array of things that we could change. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check in this update method if the particle goes off the edge of the screen. Because if it does, there's not much point still drawing it. Um, it might spiral back to the center, but who knows really what it will do. It's going to be more interesting if this particle goes out of its um, nominal kind of allotted particle space, which we decided would run from minus one to plus one uh, in the x and y directions, then we can reinitialize the particle, put it back at the center and choose a new, new random values for its um, speed and direction. So let's, let's say here, if um, m on score x is less than minus one, or it's greater than one, or m underscore y is less than minus one, or m underscore y is greater than plus one. Now we want to um, reinitialize the particle with um, some more random values. Let's create a, let's create a function up here called init, or a method I should call it technically because this function is part of a class. Let's put the code from the initialization code from the structure uh, from the constructor into init, and also initialize the um, the location, the initial location of the particle in there. And then in the constructor, we can just call init. And we need to add the prototype to that in particle for that in particle.h as well. I notice here I've got a public section for my functions, but that's sort of superfluous really. Um, it's it just uh, because in a struct rather than a class, everything's public by default anyway. But it does sort of help to separate visually the methods from the variables a bit. Um, what we can do is have a private section in here to put the speed and direction in. And I'm going to uh, make my init method private as well. Let's have another section for this because it's a function just to visually separate it from the variables. So that's void init. And uh, let's, let's try running that and see how it looks now. So now I, I think this is rather more interesting. And for some, for some reason that I'm not sure about, oh, I was going to say that it, it reduces the um, tendency of the particles to implode, but that seems not to be the case after all. Um, so I, I don't really know why it would. But it, it does look, I think, more interesting. Maybe even a bit less curl. Let's try um, 0 0.0004. Oh, that would be more. Let's try two and see how that looks. Oh, I didn't even call init. Okay. Well, I, I, I got to sleep at 7 a.m. last night <laughs> for some reason. Um, oh, that's my excuse. Okay, let's try it now. Yeah, I mean, in fact, I think what happens is um, the particles tend to go off the edge of the screen, but then they reappear in the center. And that does seem to somewhat reduce, as far as I can see from looking at this now, the tendency of the whole thing to implode. Yeah, because um, particles that eventually go off the edge, they start springing out the center again later. Don't know if it would implode, shrink to a, you know, to a point in the center if we let it run long enough. But one more, one last thing I think that we can do here is um, we can uh, take a portion of the particles at any given, uh, on any given refresh and um, re just reinitialize those randomly. So let's say if rand is less than rand underscore max divided by 100. So here we rand max is a large integer which we're dividing by 100 and, and rand is going to be an integer from naught up to rand max. So if we say that it's got to be less than uh, a hundredth of rand max, that means uh, one in every time, one in every hundred times um, this runs, 
uh, it's going to be true. And then we can just do an init, which is going to reinitialize some of our particles randomly. Now actually this, this program is not completely independent of the processing power of your computer because the, the, the blur will, is basically running as often as it can within our game, game loop. And also um, this ra random reinitialization will happen uh, kind of just as often as it can because we're not using the interval in any way in there. But um, I don't, that probably doesn't matter too much. What we've got now is something that's, that I think is much nicer. I don't know how well it shows up in, the, in my screen recording here. But um, what I can see here is um, the particles around the edge of this thing really sort of look like they're seething in and, in and out of sort of mass of molten lava or something. It's kind of like the, the surface of the sun, which I think is really interesting. Now I'm going to leave this program there now, so um, we're finished with coding in this course. Um, you could do a lot more things to make this even more exciting. This is my favourite bit, by the way. Um, you're, getting, you're getting some colour variation here because the results of the blur are left behind after the, the new particles have changed colour. And it's this colour variation that gives this a lot of its um, excitement. Uh, but what you could do is you could, in the update method of the particles, you could alter the colours of the particles separately, uh, but hopefully in such a way that um, they're sort of harmonised with each other or particles that are close by each other maybe, or have similar speeds or whatever, have similar colours as well. But you could try doing something like that to create more striking colour effects by having more colour variation among particles. That could be interesting. Well, in fact, the great thing about this programme, if you like visual things, if you're a visual person, is that it really does inspire you to just tweak it and try all kinds of new different effects. So that's it for, that, um, for this tutorial, and indeed that's it for the coding part of this course. Uh, I'm going to add a, probably, I don't know, one, one or two more videos um, just explaining a couple more things here, and we're going to take a look at uh, the, the various kinds of C's that are on offer, C Sharp, C++, Objective C, uh, and so on. Um, if, if you've actually followed through this course, well, even if you've watched the videos, congratulations. If you've actually coded this stuff and got it working, then seriously big congratulations. Uh, hopefully this will have improved your C++ a lot. If, if you were a beginner when you started the course, then, then this is an amazing achievement to have got through all this. Um, you're not going to be uh, a completely fluent programmer yet to, to, to be that. You have to practice writing your own programs a lot. You have to think about how to design those programs um, and experiment with, with different ways of coding, different ways of designing. Find something that works for you and, and just practice it endlessly. Um, but uh, hopefully you are now in a position that you could go ahead and start writing programs of your own. And you'd have an idea of, of how to do that, even quite complex programs like particle simulations. So big congratulations. Most people who start a course like this, the vast majority, never get past the first few lectures, I can tell you, which I guess is the same with a, a textbook. Okay, so um, that's it for this tutorial, and until next time, happy coding.